apologize, waiting for, I forgot to turn that on. <clears throat> it's on now though. Let me read the scripture again. Psalm 9, verse 10. They that know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken them that seek thee. Now let us go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. And I'm going to read verses 12 through 17. <clears throat> Romans 10, verse 12 through 17. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, <clears throat> how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. For they have not all, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I draw your attention to verse 17. So we sit here this morning. Faith cometh by hearing, and by hearing what? The word of God. Faith cometh by hearing the word of God. I want to remind us today that God never disappoints those who fully trust in him. God will never disappoint us. The English prayer book version says, He never has, he never does, he never will, he cannot. God cannot disappoint those that are truly trusting in him. So I ask you to, to listen again to Psalm verse, uh, chapter 9, verse 10. And they who know thy name will put their trust in thee. For thou, Lord, hast not forsaken those who seek you. They that know his name. To know his name, we really have to get to know him. We get to know him by trusting in him. God never breaks his word. He never breaks his word. He is very jealous over his word. Okay? No banker's word taken in solemn promise, signed contracts, is half as dependable. Times banks go bankrupt. They can't keep the promise or the contract that they've signed. God never breaks his word. That will never happen to God. Never happen to God. The Bible tells us that the scripture cannot be broken. John chapter 10, verse 35. God always keeps his word. God wants us to hear and understand that this morning. He always keeps his word. What God says he will do, God will do it. He will do it. He's spoken it. He will bring it to pass. Okay. God said, that which I have spoke, spoken shall surely come to pass. God doesn't just speak to hear the sound of his voice. He speaks what we need to hear. And what he speaks, he will always fulfill and do it. God has never forsaken those who trust in him. He never has. He, he never does. And he never will. He never will. God's desire for us is that we might know him, that we might truly know him. God wants us to know him and to put our trust in him for everything that we have need of. He is the Lord, our God. He is the Lord, our provider. And God has made a promise to us. He said, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Folks, that means everything that we have need of, God will supply it if we trust him. <clears throat> Most people read that verse of scripture and kind of take it out of context and think that he's talking about just money. No, God said everything 
everything that you have need of, he will supply it. He provides it for us. All we have to do is trust him, obey his word, and believe. One little important word that I just spoke. Obey him. We have to obey God. We have to do what his word tells us to do. Remember, we need to read our Bibles. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I encourage you. I've told you many times. <clears throat> I use a lot of scripture when I preach a message. And I've told you many times. Don't just take my word for it. When I'm preaching a message, don't just take my word for it. Follow the scriptures. See what the Bible says. Is pastor really preaching the, the true word? Look it up in the scriptures and see what God has. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God's desire for us is to get to really know him. How do I get to know him? I get to know him by reading his word and spending time with him in my prayer closet. Get in just alone. The prayer closet doesn't really mean a closet what you go in. Any place that, <clears throat> excuse me, any place that you can get alone with God and talk to him. Talk to him. And then learn to listen for God to speak back to your heart. God will put something in your heart. He'll tell us what to do. He guides us. Thoughts will come into our head, into our heart, and we'll know that wasn't my thought. It come from God. He speaks to us in those ways. <clears throat> God wants you to really begin to trust him today. <clears throat> Excuse me, please. God wants you, us to trust him today. God wants to bless his people. As I said, I have spent much time. After Wednesday, <clears throat> when this gentleman left, I began to pray and God began to speak something to my heart. Question. question. God asked question. Question, he spoke into my heart. Is this a blessing to the church? I said, yes, Lord, yes. <clears throat> he said, God spoke again. I bless my people in obedience. As I continue to pray, God spoke to my There are some, there are some attending the church that are missing out the blessings of God because they are not being obedient to God. They are not receiving the blessings of God in your life and in your homes because, again, you're not obeying God. You're not doing what God tells us to do. <clears throat> God has given us his word to keep and to obey. And he has promised to bless all those that hear his word and obey him. As you sit here this morning, I'm asking, I'm telling you what God spoke to me. I have prayed over it. I've asked God several times, Lord, is this what you want me to share? And it would not leave me. I tried to get other messages. Wouldn't happen. God had a word that he wanted to give his people. Now there's going to be some here that won't receive that word. They don't believe that. But nonetheless, it's the word of God. It's right out of the Bible. And we're going to listen to what God says. God has a spiritual law. He has a spiritual law. It says, give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over. Shall men add into your bosom. Man says, the way to get ahead in life, hoard everything you get. Hoard it. Hold on to it. Don't give it out. Don't give it away. Don't bless others with it. You hoard it. That's the only way, says man, that you're going to get ahead in this life. Be stingy, be greedy, and hoard it. But, remember, God says this. Your ways are not his ways. Nor my thoughts, his thoughts. That's not God's way. God says, give, and it shall be given unto you. God blesses the givers, whatever it is. You see a person in need, God puts it on here. If you give, you're going to bless them. 
you're going to receive a blessing for being obedient to God. It's going to be a blessing all the way around. But it goes a little deeper than that. God says we are to pay his tithe. Ten percent of everything we get belongs to God. Belongs to God. It's not ours. It belongs to God. God has given us a job, a responsibility. That responsibility that God gives us is that we are stewards. Everything we have belongs to God. We are stewards. What is a steward? If you look in Webster's Dictionary, a steward is one that manages the property of another. Everything we're, we're managing it for God. It belongs to God. And at any time, God should say, I need it back. I need it for thus and so. And as his steward, we are to give it as God asks. So I ask you to think about this. God says to us, give and it shall be given. Then he, tell, he makes a promise in Malachi 3.10. God said, if we give and are obedient to him, he will open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon us that there will not be room enough to receive it. Not be room enough to receive it. I was talking to my older sister this week, Patty, and she was talking about somebody that was, had just lost their job and were out of work. And she said, do you know, we are blessed. And I told her, I said, Patty, from the time that I started working, I have never been out of a job. Never been out of a job. I started working as a dishwasher in a, res a restaurant at the age of 15. I got in doing that. Then they promoted me to, a, they called it at that time, preparation boy. I made all of the salads. I cooked the roast and all of that stuff. From that, I moved, made it to a fry cook. I started working the grill. And then I met, went on to be the day manager. God just kept blessing. When I turned 18, I was able to get a job in a factory, a plant, an anodizing plant. I worked that job for about four years. And fry, one Friday came and they passed out checks, our checks. There was a little notice. A foreman told me, Business has been slow, as you know, so we have to lay you off. So he apologized and he said, if you don't have a job, when we can get busy again, we'll call you back. That was Friday, three o'clock in the afternoon. I started home. I didn't know what I was gonna say to Ruth. I'd lost my job. When I got home, Ruth told me, Pete Phillips wants you to call him. So I called him. He worked in construction. He said, we need a, a man to come and work, looking for a job to work construction with me. He said, would you be interested? I said, yes. He said, you'll go to work with me Monday. I went, they put me through, through a few tests to see if I could do it. They hired me. I worked that job for almost a year. And then the same thing. The bottom fell out of construction. Friday, they laid me off. I got back home. Ruth told me, there's a letter in the mail for you from Trimview. I opened it and it said, your job is open, come back to work Monday. I've never been without a job, never. God has always provided. That's the way he is. I told my sister, I said, honey, God's blessed us all of our lives. God has blessed us. You can't outgive God. If we're obedient to him, God will take care of us. So I want to say to you, to all of those who are not obeying this command, God says, if you read the Bible, God says you're cursed with a curse because God says that you are robbing God. He said, Pastor, how can I be robbing God? What does the Bible tell us? 10% belongs to who? To God. 
10%, that first 10%. Notice I said that first 10%. Well, Pastor, sometimes I get paid during the middle of the week and I won't be to church till Sunday. How do I do the first? You write out the check. The first check you write out before you pay a bill to anything, you pay God his tithe. Then you hold it till Sunday and put it in. You've been obedient to God. Let God bless you. Some will say to me this morning, in your minds you're thinking, Pastor, I cannot afford to pay God's tithe. I am on welfare, or I don't make enough money. We're just barely getting by. I ask you to think of something. You think if that is your attitude, I can't afford it, then you're not trusting God. What did God say? I will meet all your needs, all your needs. I want you to remember something. I have spent a lot of time this week praying and seeking God. And this is what God has given me. The word of God says, they that know God's name will put their trust in him. For thou, Lord, has not forsaken those who seek you. God has not forsaken us. He never can. He never will. He will, he will honor those, honor those who are obedient to him. Remember, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. I want to give you, God promised to meet all, I want to give you a few examples from the Bible. Do you remember Elijah? God sent Elijah, he was a prophet, God sent Elijah to Ahab, King Ahab. Ahab had turned away from God. He was erecting idols all over Israel. He was leading the people into idol worship. Things begin, the people begin to turn from God and things begin to be horrible. God said to Elijah, I want you to go to Ahab. I have a message. After Elijah went, delivered the message. And I want to remind you of something. Ahab was king. He was a wicked king. He had the power to kill people that he wanted or to let people live. If he didn't like you or didn't like something you said, he could have you put to death. He had done it many times. It was no small thing for Elijah to go and stand before Ahab with such a message. But he obeyed God. He trusted God. Then God said to him after he gave him the message, God said, now I want you to leave here and go to Cherith to the brook Cherith. I have commanded the ravens to feed you. Think about that. Ravens. Okay. Morning and evening, God said, they'll come morning and evening and bring you meat and bread to feed you. Now, can you imagine this? All alone in a, wilderness, a beautiful wilderness setting, right there by a running brook, plenty of water, Plenty of relaxation. But after a while, the brook begins to dry up. I can imagine. Elijah probably thought, well, what am I going to do now? What am I going to do when the water runs out? But he didn't leave. He didn't say, well, I'd better get up and go find another place. He stayed there, obeyed God, until God told him to move. Then God said to him, now I want you to go to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow woman, provided a widow woman to feed you. So when he gets to Zarephath, he walks through the gate. He sees an a elderly lady, stooped over, picking up sticks. And he called out to her and he said, bring me a, a cup of water. And she went to get it. And he said, and would you bring me a little cake to eat? And she stopped and she looked at him. And she said, I only have a little bit of meal and a small amount of oil, just enough to make two cakes, one for me, one for my son. We're going to eat it and die. There's nothing else. Remember, there's a famine in the land. There is nothing else. They didn't have welfare programs in those days. They didn't have food banks. She was left on her own. 
And Elijah said, go and do what you said. You go make those two cakes, but bring me the first one. Uh-oh. How would you respond to that? There's just enough for you and your son. How would you respond? But Elijah said to her, you go make those cakes, give me the first one. Because the Lord says, the meal will never run out, the oil will never run out until the famine is over. She obeyed, she did what God said, and God took care of her. The meal never ran out, the oil never ran out, until the famine was over. God provided. Okay. He still does. He still does. I ask you to think about the Shunammite woman. Elijah and his servant passed by their house often when they were getting to go to the school of the prophets or wherever they were going. They would pass by her house. And she invited them to come in and have a meal. So they did that several times. And she said to her husband, these come by. Why don't we make a little room for them? Let's build a little room on the roof of the house. So they built a room. And she put a bed in it, a little table, a lampstand. And every time they came, she invited Elijah to go up there and rest. One day, uh, Elijah's thinking about her, wondering, what can I do to repay her? And so he asked her, would you like for me to speak to the king for you? She said, no, thanks. I do well among my own people. She said, well, then would you like for me to speak to some of the elders? No, no, thank you. So he looked at his servant and he said, what could we do for her? And her servant said, look, she has no children and her husband's old. So Elijah prayed. He said, call her back. And he said to her, this time next year, you will have a son. Oh, don't lie to me, thou man of God. Time came, she had the son. God provided. He does what he says he will do. He'll provide for all of our needs. I ask you to think about Elisha. God called Elijah. He sent him up on the mountain here. I won't go into the detail of that. But he decided, Jezebel said she was going to kill him. In fear, he ran off. He and his servants went off into the wilderness. Pretty soon he said to his servant, you stay here. I'm going to go further into the wilderness. I want to be alone. So he went and he sat down under a tree and he said, listen to me carefully. I have talked to many people. As a pastor, I've talked to many people who have said this same thing to me. He said, Lord, take my life. I just want to die. I don't want to go on any further. I am the only one left serving you. So just take my life. I've had individuals come to me and say, Pastor, because of sickness or because of other things going on in their lives, Pastor, I just, I don't want to live anymore. I just want, I just want to die. I just want to go to heaven. I'm hurting. I'm broken. You know what God did to Elijah? He woke him up and there was a fire going. There's a meal cooking on the fire. The angel of the Lord speaks to him and said, Arise, Elijah, set up and eat. The journey's too great for you. This happened three times. God took him to the mountain. He told him, I want you to do some things. And he told him what to do. And he said, Go and anoint Elisha to be prophet in your stead. Time goes by. Elisha is studying under Elijah. And one day, the Lord says, He's going to take Elijah home. The prophets began to speak everywhere they went. They'd ask Elijah, don't you know the Lord's going to take Elijah home today? Yes, I know. Hold your peace. I don't want to talk about it. He continued everywhere Elijah would go. 
he would tell Elisha, you stay here, the Lord send me here. Elisha said, no, I will not leave you. He went on. When they came to the brook Jordan, the river Jordan, they're standing there, the waters are raging. And Elijah looked at Elisha and he said, ask me whatever you want. Ask me what you want me to do for you. Elisha looked at him and he said, I want a double portion of your spirit. A double portion. But you've asked a hard thing. But nevertheless, if you see me when I go up, it shall be. They went on. Elijah smoked the water. The waters parted. They crossed over. All of a sudden, horses in a chariot are going into the heavens. Elisha looks up and said, the, chariot, the horsemen and chariots of God. Elijah began to rise up into the air. He dropped his mantle and it begins to fall to the ground. When Elisha saw him disappear, the Bible said he ripped his clothes, which was a sound of, uh, of, of mourning. He went over and he picked up the mantle. He walked back to the river. He looked at that river. He rolled the mantle. He smacks it on the water. And he asked a question. I think it's a question that many of you here this morning have asked at one time or other in your life. You've asked this question. Things that you're going through, problems, hurts, financial problems, whatever it is, has brought you to that place. And you say, where is God? Where is God now? Why is this happening? Where is God now? Elisha looking at that water. He said, where is the Lord God of Elisha? And he smacks the water. And immediately the waters parted. If you go on to read your Bibles, if you go on to read the life of Elisha, you'll find recorded double the amount of miracles that Elisha, Elijah had done. God honored his request. He obeyed God. God honored his crest and used him mightily for the Lord. I want to share one more with you. One of the prophets had died. He had two sons and a wife. They didn't have anything. The only thing they had left in their house was a, a jar of oil. Nothing. She went to Elisha, the prophet, and she said, Elisha, you know that my husband was a good man of God. He was a prophet. He obeyed God. He did whatever God told him. He served God. And now the creditors are come. They want to take my sons and put them into slavery to pay off the debt. Elijah, Elisha asked her, what do you have in your house? She said, I don't have anything but one jug of oil. He said, all right, I want you to go around all of your neighbors. I want you to borrow jugs and pots and pans, anything you could borrow. Bring it into your house and shut the door and begin to fill those pots and the jugs with oil. Begin to fill them. She kept pouring and pouring. Her sons kept bringing her containers. And finally they said, this is the last one. And she said, no more, no more, mom. Immediately, that jug would fill, the oil quit pouring. She went back to Elisha and she told him what had happened. She said, what do I do with it? And he said, I want you to go and sell it. Sell it all. And then pay the debt. And you and your family live on the rest of it. I don't know how much it was, but it must have been a huge amount to feed her and her family indefinitely. Use it to live on. What a God we serve. What a God we serve. Some would say to me, Pastor, what about today? What about today? Does God still do those things? A while back... I was reading a book on tithing and so forth, and I read this account, okay? Reverend S.D. Gordon 
tells about a Finnish lady. They were running, they didn't have a church, they were just meeting together. They wanted to build a chapel, but they didn't have the money to do it. They didn't have. For five months, she did everything she knew to do, and the people were, tried to raise the money. But they could not raise it. They just didn't have it. Okay. The bill for the lumber was $750. They did not have it. She had $80 in the drop box that people came and put their money in the box. That's all she had. Okay. She had $18 of her own. But the Lord impressed her heart to pray this prayer. Lord Jesus, bless thy money as thou didst bless the loaves in the wilderness. I will put in my loaves too. In thy hands and do thou let them with thine meet the need. Let this money cover the amount of the bill. Now she had $70 and then her $18 and that made $88. She needed $750. She just didn't know what to do. She began to count it. She began to count it. The Lord told her to count the money. She began to count it. She put it in stacks of 100. She had seven stacks of 100 and one stack of $51. Okay. But she noticed that there was a lot of gold, a lot of gold, before there had been none. Okay. Then God spoke to her, Isaiah 60, verse 17. Would you bring it up on the screen for me, please? Isaiah chapter 60, verse 17. And it says, For brass... I will bring gold. For iron, I will bring silver. For wood, brass. And for stones, iron. I will also make thy officers peace and thy exactors to be for righteousness. God told her what he did. Gave her the scripture to stand on. Okay. But it doesn't end there. When the sheriff came to collect the bill, the bill was paid in full, and he put and he took out of his own pocket and put it in the collector's box. Then she remembered her prayer to the Lord, that the collection box would never be empty, that God would always provide putting something in the collection box. She has never, God has never forsaken thee. He will never forsake those that trust in him. What about today? I just shared with you what happened this past week. Time and again, God has used individuals to help meet the needs. Help meet the needs. Our God is a great, mighty God. God has used some of you in ways that he's to meet the needs that are here. The blessings of God. All God is asking is that we be faithful, that we obey him, trust him and obey him. So I'm gonna ask you to, to bow your heads for a minute. Please, nobody looking around. I want us to think about, David, would you please bring Psalm 9, verse 10 back up on the screen for me. Psalm 9, verse 10. Our heads are bowed, I wanna ask you, do you, trust God? Are you really trusting him? Are you being obedient to what he says? I want you to lift your head up for a minute and look at the screens. Look at the screens. I ask you to read out loud with me what it says. And they that know thy name will put their trust in thee, for thou, Lord, has not forsaken them that seek you. They that know thy name. Again, bow your head. Do you really know his name? Do you know his name? The Lord God, our provider. Do you know him as your provider? Just like the woman of Zarephath. Those of you that God is speaking to your heart, and I know there are some because the Holy Spirit brought this to me. 
Those of you that God's, God wants to bless you. He's not after your money. God doesn't need your money. He doesn't need any of our money. I ask you to think about something. I've asked this question before, but I want to ask it again this morning. God doesn't need our money. Where were we when God created heaven and earth and everything in it? Where were we? Did God ask for our advice then? Did he tell us, I, I need this from you to do this? No. God doesn't need our money. What does he want? He wants our trust and our obedience. Our trust and our obedience. God will take care of every need we have if we obey him. Just like the widow of Zarephath. God wants you to start obeying him today. He says this, Prove me now, saith the Lord. Father, I stand before you this morning, accountable unto you for the message that I have preached. I have given what you gave me to preach, but I cannot change a heart. I cannot change a mind. Only you can do that. So, Father, I'm asking you, those whose hearts you're dealing with, I'm asking they would surrender completely to you. Trust you with all of our heart. That's what you tell us in Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will direct your path. I ask you to touch these, every individual here this morning. May the desire of every one of our hearts to be obedient to your word. To get into the Bible, begin to read your word, and respond in obedience. I ask you today in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 Again, I ask you, obey God. God speaking to you on this matter, surrender to